Hi, I'm Steve Levin, Security Best Practices Lead at Palo Alto Networks. Welcome to the second video in our series about quantum computing and its impact on security. Once again, two of Palo Alto Networks' quantum technology and cryptography experts, Richu and Phil, are joining me. Our first session focused on the security threat from quantum computers and how to think about transitioning to a post-quantum security solution. The following sessions focus on planning a transition to a quantum-resistant network, post-quantum crypt cryptography, quantum key distribution, and quantum random number generators. Today's session focuses on the impact of threats from cryptographically relevant quantum computers on your company. Richu, with cryptographically relevant quantum computers on the horizon, thinking about the encryption used in our companies today, which technologies are at risk? Yeah, Steve, before we talk about these applications, let me spend some time highlighting quantum algorithms that are accelerating this risk. The Shor's algorithm is significant because it implies that public key cryptography might be easily broken given a sufficiently large quantum computer. RSA, for example, uses a public key N, which is the product of two large prime numbers. One way to crack RSA is by factoring N, uh, but with classical algorithms, factoring n becomes increasingly time-consuming as n grows large. In fact, it grows exponentially larger. By contrast, Shor's algorithm can crack RSA in polynomial time. It is also able to break and attack other public key crypto systems. Like all quantum algorithms, Shor's algorithm is probabilistic. It gives the correct answer with a very high probability and the probability of failure can be decreased by repeating the algorithm. And then we have Grover's algorithm, also another quantum algorithm that is able to find with high probability the input to any black box function with a particular output. Classical computation cannot be solved in fewer than O function n evaluations to get a 50% chance of finding the right output. But with Grover's, the problem needs to evaluate the function under square root of n time. In summary, classical algorithms require exponentially many steps, while Grover's provides a quadratic speed up for unstructured search. Grover's algorithm could brute force a 128-bit symmetric cryptographic key in 2 to the power 64 iterations, or a 256-bit key in 2 to the power 128 iterations. Today, with the quantum computing innovation and limitations taken into consideration, symmetric cryptography that is susceptible to Grover's attack can be secured by increasing the size of AES keys to 256 bits for just the interim future. Steve, now that we understand Shor's and Grover's a little bit more, if I had to highlight the high-risk technologies, it all comes down to asymmetric cryptography that's at highest risk because of Shor's algorithm. And that includes RSA for key exchange and digital signatures and certificates, also for software signing. It also includes elliptical curve algorithms, ECDHE used in key exchange, ECDSA used in digital signatures. But we are still relatively more than a decade away from being able to break symmetric encryption using Grover's. So AES with a large key size and secure hash functions like SHA-2 or SHA-3 with increased rounds for larger output should strengthen symmetric encryption and buy us more time. Now as a CISO or a CIO, if you're wondering where should my team get started, given harvesting attacks, the top applications we should start securing today are VPN and SSL. Let's talk about VPN. Be it site to site or client to server, VPN is leveraged for that bulk data transfer across data centers globally, or even for uploads and downloads at the user end. And especially data between data centers are either sensitive or confidential, and they hold a very long-term value. The next one is SSL or TLS, which is what HTTPS, SMTP, FTPS, and many other internet protocol rely on. It's safe to say SSL is the fabric of over 95% of communications today. And as an industry, we are getting up to securing SSL with post-quantum cryptography. Next, digital signatures used in certificates have also been fundamental to the zero, zero trust architecture that the industry has converged on as a national security matter. So while stateful and stateless digital signatures have their own applications, 
we do expect that the industry to take some more time to converge on the implementations of a DSA, especially for certificates. Besides these top three, other impacted applications are software signing, where a digital signature is used to prove the integrity of the piece of code that was delivered by a certain sender, the potential for supply chain attacks to tamper with code or inject malware are very significantly high if the code is not secured with a post-quantum signature. Authentication, of course, again, goes back to the use of digital signatures for users and devices. And lastly, I do want to talk on SSH, a network protocol that gives users a secure way to access their system across the internet. This is also at risk. And though a majority of the industry has secured SSH over a VPN tunnel, this is yet another application that has to be transitioned to post-quantum. Not to scare you or the audience, Steve, but in summary, what I want to say is every business will be impacted. And it's important to start prioritizing what applications need to be migrated to post-quantum security just as much as prioritizing for what assets and users that you are going to first do the migration for. Well, well, clearly the potential risk is very high. Phil, in uh, one of your early, our earlier discussions, you mentioned something called a harvesting attack. Can you explain what that is and how it affects us today, even though CRQCs aren't here yet? Yeah, basically in its simplest form, Steve, a harvesting attack is basically me capturing the information, storing it, and then basically replaying it back when a cryptographic computer is available. So if we take a look at the slide, right, we should all know this, how PKI works in general, right? We have a sender and a receiver. We use a combination of both private keys as well as public keys to generate a symmetric key, as Rishu mentioned, to secure that content that we want to send securely over an untrusted network. And so basically what I'm going to do as a, as a harvester is capture that information with the key exchange as well as the payload that you just encrypted with that new symmetric key. So if I capture both of those elements, I'm going to store it for any amount of period of time until a cryptographically relevant quantum computer is available, and then I take it out of storage, I replay it, and now I can reverse engineer it and get the plain text back. So that is basically what a harvesting attack is all about. So Steve, one of the other things that I get asked a lot when I'm talking with uh, customers is how prevalent really is a harvesting attack. Does it happen today, right? And so if you take a look at the internet and you do a little bit of research, you're gonna find out that it's on the rise. Nation states doing harvesting attacks is increasing. And if you take a look at the details of what's out there as public information, you're gonna see that nation states have been harvesting information from the United States, for example, or information from the European nations. And what they're doing is, again, storing this in hopes of a quantum computer becoming available within the next five or eight years and then basically breaking that. So it's not just you know, harvesting attacks that are increasing, but we're also seeing attacks from nation states rise in all different areas as well. And so this is something that is of concern to us as well. These are just other stories that I found that talks more about harvesting attacks. But this last story is rather interesting. This was a study that Deloitte did in the last two years, and it basically interviewed a whole bunch of C-level execs and found that a majority of them thought that the information that their companies generated and transmitted were of potential interest to a nation state, a competitor, or a malware actor. And so their responses was just a little over half of the people interviewed thought harvesting could apply to them. And so this isn't as, say, rare as we'd like it to be. <laughs> Richu, aside from a harvesting attack, are there other immediate concerns that IT professionals should consider? Absolutely. So very few understand the interim problems most early adopter customers are going to run into. With the proliferated use of PQCs and SSL, there's a lot of experimentation being run with PQCs. And these ciphers are pre-standards, at least as of September 2023. And even post-standardization, be it late 23 or early 24, they still have a potential to become vulnerable. And this vulnerability could be because of a sophisticated computer quantum algorithm, or it could be actually an AI that's trying to break these uh, post-quantum ciphers. We know two such shortlisted ciphers in submission round three, Psych and Rainbow, 
fell to a classical computer in 2022. This makes it challenging for early adopters to migrate production infrastructure without a guarantee of stability in the new PQCs. Chrome browser announced support for hybrid post-quantum ciphers in August 23. This now, again, it makes it extremely easy for end users to initiate a post-quantum encrypted SSL session to perhaps a self-hosted open SSL with LibOQS, which is open quantum safe library. And then this can particularly become concerning when the security and network admins cannot control or restrict the use of PQCs in your own enterprise, given how simple and accessible endpoint and server libraries with PQCs are today. Steve, where do you think this is going to take us? Your enterprise can potentially have PQC SSL traffic in your infrastructure, corporate devices reaching out to the internet using PQC SSL, and you have no way to monitor or capture this traffic. Not a single security or network traffic monitoring tool is able to detect this traffic today, and this lack of traceability creates a major blind spot. Not just that, since this is encrypted traffic, and no security product is able to decrypt or even inspect this traffic, threat concerns of internal bad actors leveraging PQCs to bypass network monitoring, also evade decryption, and then potentially exfiltrate data, leverage these sessions for maybe spear phishing, or allow malware to be brought into the enterprise, is the real concern many large enterprises and even government agencies are faced with. With no monitoring of PQC SSL, there can be no control of threat traffic originating or terminating at a certain user or server. Other than this threat, as a caution, I do want to highlight, we are also observing multiple offerings of an overlay solution and temporary browser plugins being pitched as a solution. Some early adopter customers seem to be experimenting with these. However, these solutions lack backward compatibility to connect across a variety of services or endpoints. They often require their point product at both ends of the session to be successful. This kind of takes away from the real intent of why TLS and or SSL protocol is in, its use, is in use in itself. Well, and on top of all that, we haven't yet talked about another important crypto technology that's used today, and that's digital certificates. Yeah. Is there a quantum computing threat against digital certificates? Yes, there is, Steve. As many digital certificates are secured with RSA, a quantum computer can also break that protection and allow a bad actor to use that certificate or even impersonate the actual certificate owner. On top of that, yeah, a harvesting cat really doesn't have the same effect on the certificate authentication it did with decryption of the harvested data. So really the urgency or the priority is a little bit lower for authentication versus the privacy use case. Now, as we get closer to when a cryptographically relevant quantum computer becomes available, the way that the industry is going to tackle this is to upgrade our classic CAs and digital certificates with a post-quantum CA and a post-quantum certificate when the time comes. And I think this will be a year and a half to two years when we think a quantum computer is going to become viable. And that's going to help keep our infrastructure safe on the certificate side. Yeah, so there's, there's still a lot of work being done on standardization. Uh, the next generation of PQ certificates are yet to come. Some options being touted are hybrid certificates, again, with two concatenated signatures or two separate certificates in itself. Um, a third option is also composite certificates where one signature is encapsulated with another. Now, we'll just have to see how the standards play out over the next year or so, and then we can make a choice. Thank you, Richu and Phil. That nicely summarizes the threats quantum computing and quantum cryptography pose to businesses. Today we covered how Shor's and Grover's algorithms break asymmetric and symmetric encryption. And we talked about how many of today's security components that we rely on for data privacy are at risk and how that affects business and network applications. We also discussed how harvesting attacks represent some of the biggest threats because they can be performed now, before the advent of cryptographically relevant quantum computers. And we might not even know the attack is happening. So thanks for joining us and joining us again for our third video in the series, which shows you how to prepare for and start your transition to quantum readiness.